I've ever seen this movie where the Millers with this guy who gets in trouble with his friend and they have to create this uh, fake family and they go and try and like sneak drugs back to Mexico. If you haven't seen it, that's okay, but it's a really funny movie. The reason why I brought up the movie We're the Millers is because the movie ties in today's lesson, which is what's called the Miller Act. And the Miller Act is a provision under USC Chapter 31, which helps protect contractors from uh, non-payment of supplies and or labor when working on federal contracts. You've probably never heard of it, but this is going to save you a lot of money and a lot of headache in the future by knowing this information. So pay attention. The Miller Act, well, actually what's called, the, what was formerly known as the Miller Act, what happens is it requires that the prime contractors who get federal contracts put bonds on the job. A bond is a form of insurance policy that it provides protection for you and I out there who are working on these federal contracts. Because as you may or may not know, you cannot sue the federal government for non-payment. So if you're working on a federal job, you do not have the right or ability to put a lien on a federal facility. That Department of Justice, the White House, you can't lien the White House, you can lien your Aunt Sally's house. So the Miller Act requires that prime contractors give a bond to ensure protection for the little guys out there in this world. That's the good thing. Now, again, if you comply and you meet the requirements, meaning that um, you the bond, the job, 90 days afterwards, you weren't not paid, you file a claim, you have up to one year to file that claim. If you meet all those provisions, then you are due your money. However, the bad side of that is this. The Miller Act provision provides protection if you are first tier and second tier subcontractors. It does not provide protection if you fall outside of that window. So Eric, what is a first tier and a second tier subcontractor? Let's go over here to my screen and take a look at what I'm talking about here. So first tier and second tier subcontractors, you have the government at the top, right? And then they provide a contract to the prime. So the prime is the one that provides the bond for the job. Cool. So we're protected. So we got the government and then we got the prime. Now, then we start talking about people who work underneath the prime. And as you know, some of these jobs are really large, 50 million, 100 million, even 50 billion. So they're going to have a whole bunch of people working below them. Now, those companies, sometimes a subcontractor, when we're looking at on the federal level, a subcontractor, his scope of work, his scope of services could be $50 million himself or $500 million for all that matter. If they're building, for example, uh, ships or submarines, their scope of work could be a $50 million package. So naturally, uh, if you're building a ship and you're giving a part of the contract that's $50 million, you're going to have people working below you. The people that work below that guy is considered second tier subcontractors. So again, we've got this really large company that's building this military installation um, that they're going to be then in turn building ships and submarines. Now, the big company has the one billion dollar contract, right? So we got big company has the one billion dollar contract. That big company is considered the prime contractor. Now he hires a company to build a ship. So this next guy, his job is to build the ship. His contract is 50 million. They hire five of those companies. So now the prime contractor has a $1 billion contract. The second guy has a $50 million contract. The, that guy is considered a first tier subcontractor. Now anybody that works below him is considered a second tier subcontractor. All right. So again, you've got the guys building the ships is number one. Then the ship building guy hires some companies. Let's say he hires a company to paint the entire ship. And we know ships are pretty big. So let's say the ship's contract for painting is four million, right? They gotta paint the ship inside and out. Beautiful ship, they need to paint it sparkly clean. All right, so that package is four million dollars. Now you come along, right? And you're this little guy coming out here, you're excited to get started working in the Federal Arena. You're like, bam, I got my first contract. This guy gave me a contract to paint this ship, right? So, but again, because you want to start small because you're afraid to go after the big contracts, you're starting small and you're saying, look, man, just you, you're bragging, you're excited. Hey, Eric, look, I just got this contract for $200,000 to paint this ship. Well, guess what? You're a third tier subcontractor. So guess what? 
there's no, you have no remedies for ensuring that that person who got the painting contract to paint the ship is going to pay you to paint that ship. There's no recourse and there's no remedies. Yeah, naturally you could sue them if you've got the money and the resources, but there's no protections, there's no provisions in the law that govern that. So now you would have to sue them at your own expense. And also let's assume that um, you try to complain to someone at the top, they're gonna tell you, they're gonna read you this law. They're gonna reference this particular section in the law. They're gonna reference this chapter here that says, talks about bonds, what's called formally known as the Miller Act. So I want to let you guys know out there, if you're out there and you're operating in the auspice of the government, when you're out there and you're operating and you're excited, know what position you are in on a contract, know how close you are to the actual contract holder so that that way you can ensure you're protected. I'll give you a really quick example story of how this affected me. Um, I was on a job and again, same thing. Uh, there was this prime contract they were hired by the actual military base and we were working out in Texas and we were building these, uh, we were actually working on the border, building a border patrol station. So the major contract, they had the job to do the entire like border patrol station itself. They then hired out a package, a metal building package to someone to do all the supply, the design, the engineering. So then that guy became the first tier. He then hired me to do the actual buildings themselves, right? So then I became the second tier subcontractor. Well, I then supplied, I got my equipment from H&E, which provided equipment to the job. So they were the ones that provided the equipment to the job. Of course, naturally I need equipment, right? And I don't own all the boom lifts and the machines that I needed. So then H&E then became a third tier to me. So guess what happens when the second guy who had the uh, contract decided not to pay because he failed to do something on his part. It then left me in a position where I could not pay H&E, but H&E had no recourse to pursue the actual prime contractor or the government or the other guy for that matter. So it left kind of us all in this conundrum where everyone, um, we were kind of like, it kind of rolled downhill as you know the old saying. Now, the good thing about that, for me at least, was because H&E was a much larger entity than myself, H&E then had the power, they had the attorneys and the muscle behind them to actually sue the company who hired me to do the job. Now, you and I may not have the ability to do that, but the good side was H&E hired an attorney. The attorney, uh, I gave them all the contract information. I let them know what was happening. They read my contract. They knew who hired me. They read that person's contract. And then H&E was able to go above my head and sue the actual contractor, the second tier guy who hired me, who didn't pay me. They were able to sue him and get the money that was due to them um, in that case. So in my particular situation, it worked out great. It's not going to always work out that way for everyone out there. But again, the point is, the more information that you know, the more you're aware, then you can take precautionary efforts in place when we work with some of these companies. Maybe you could do things like ask for some money up front. Maybe you can uh, ask for a smaller window in terms of being paid. Whatever steps that you need to take to protect yourselves, I want to inform and educate everyone out there so that you can take those necessary steps. All right. Thanks for watching today.